thank you for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be giving an overview on scientific publishing, how it influences how we do science, and looking at some current innovations in this area and kind of what the future holds. Um, there we go. Uh, so to start you off with some quick terms, um, I'm going to be using throughout the talk for those of you that are less familiar with scientific publishing. And then I will go into detail on some of these a bit later. So the first term, a scientific article, paper or manuscript, put simply is a written report describing original scientific work. Um, the traditional format of uh, this kind of paper is an abstract, an introduction, methods, results, and then a discussion section. An article, paper, and manuscript are kind of terms all used interchangeably. I use kind of manuscript for the draft version, or sometimes a different version of the paper, but others might use the term differently. And then a journal, what we mean by this uh, is where scientific articles are published. They used to be paper-based, but the majority are now online. Um, and the journal topic area can vary. So it could be quite a broad journal, or focus on one kind of specific area. Also the frequency of uh, how often articles are published in this journal can vary. Um, so it could be constantly, or it could be something like monthly. And then with the traditional kind of journal hierarchy, you'll have a chief editor at the top making strategic decisions. And then you often have what is referred to as handling editors. So their role really varies depending on the journal, but they'll evaluate the papers coming in they may desk reject them at this point if they feel they aren't good quality or send them out for peer review. And ultimately, uh, they decide whether a paper is published. So they may be employed by the journal directly or they may be active academics volunteering their time. And then peer review, as I just mentioned. So this is a journal editor sending the paper out to others who work in the same field who can assess the quality of the paper. And they can make suggestions on what can be changed in the paper and also recommendations on whether it should be published. And then for these last two terms, I will go into more detail, um, but just quickly for now, a subscription journal. Authors can publish here for free, but this content is behind a paywall and institutions may need to pay subscription fees. And open access, you'll often uh, hear people refer to open access as a larger movement, but for now you just need to understand that for an open access journal, anyone can access the content, but the authors publishing there may need to pay a fee. So I also just wanted to give a quick background on me um, and some potential biases that I might be bringing to this talk because of that. Um, so just a bit of a background on my career. So I did a degree in biomedical science, but I was incredibly clumsy in the lab. So I decided a PhD wasn't for me. And I started looking for jobs that I could do with my degree. So my first job fresh out of uni was at the journal Scientific Reports, which is part of the Springer Nature Group, which is a huge publisher. And that journal is often referred to as a mega journal. So it's a broad disciplinary journal in life sciences and publishes papers if the science is scientifically sound, rather than selecting for papers on novelty or perceived importance. So I joined there as a publishing assistant. My role was finding academics to act as handling editors for the papers, so helping invite peer reviewers to the paper, and then ensuring final decisions on the paper were within the journal criteria. So there has been a lot of criticism around kind of mega journals, particularly around the scale, because they're publishing so many papers. They're often seen as kind of pumping papers out for money and lacking in quality checks, um, which I can dispute. Uh, but on the scale side, just to give you an idea, I was handling around kind of 400 papers personally. And by the time I left, there were around 30 publishing assistants. So you can see the kind of volume we're deal dealing with. So I was there for a couple of years before moving to F1000 Research. And I was there for about three and a half years. F1000 Research, again, was a kind of life sciences journal, but really aimed to be a kind of disruptor in the system. We weren't owned by one of the big publishing houses. And we had a very eccentric owner who loved to use the word kind of revolution and try and do everything as openly as possible. So whilst I was there, I worked in a lot of kind of community outreach, encouraging communities to have kind of gateways on the F1000 research journal platform, which were basically mini journals using our model. And we also branched into setting up journals for funders, such as Welcome and the Health Research Board in Ireland, 
So you can see in that photo of me there, um, that's me in Dublin kind of promoting the HRB platform with some coffee cups and a huge cake uh, to entice people. And then F1000 Research was eventually bought by the big publishing house, Taylor and Francis, which personally for me was a low. I really kind of believed in the disruptor model and it definitely felt like the kind of golden community days were over. There was kind of more of a focus on money, bottom lines and kind of marketing. So I definitely, when I left there, I left quite jaded and quite quickly. Um, and then I did some other bits before ending up at Turing. So I thought this is important background uh, because this is a fairly opinionated talk. Um, so just wanted to give that. And then because of my experience today, the talk I'll be giving has a scientific slant. Humanities publishing is really interesting and has evolved in quite a different way to scientific publishing, but I won't be covering that today. So I wanted to start off with a kind of brief history of scientific publishing, mainly with a kind of UK lens, but also some of this does apply internationally too. So the first ever scientific journal was in 1665 called Philosophical Transactions and was published by the Royal Society. It published letters about scientific observations and experiments, and these kind of reports and advances were shared at Royal Society meetings. Um, so it's interesting to see that kind of openness and sharing between scientists was kind of key right from the beginning. And then around 200 years later, we had Nature's first issue, uh, which many of you might have heard of. And then the 1950s, uh, this is where things started to get really interesting. So this guy here is a proper character called uh, Robert Maxwell. And he was basically the mastermind behind commercializing scientific publishing. He established a kind of huge publishing house with journals, with grand titles, so kind of always international journal of. And then that he realized that kind of getting your work seen was a form of prestige for scientists and that this was kind of marketable. So really kind of established what we see with that kind of commercialization and publishing today. I don't have time to kind of go into more detail around this, but I would really recommend if you're going to read one thing on scientific publishing, then I would really recommend this uh, long read on The Guardian. It came out about five years ago, but it's still really relevant. And it's got a kind of great overview about profit and things like that in scientific publishing. And then lastly, in the 1970s, we had this establishment of the formal peer review process. It always kind of existed in some form since uh, the kind of philosophical transaction days. The journals only started formally inviting external reviewers to check every paper in the 1970s and 80s, which still exists in the process today. So at the start of the 2000s, um, a movement emerged called open access and gained momentum. So traditionally, journals up to this point were subscription journals, so their content was behind a paywall and only subscribing institutions could get access. So the push here, particularly around the time that the internet was becoming more commonly used, was for this scientific knowledge to become open so others can use it and kind of build upon this knowledge while the authors are kind of properly credited. So there were kind of various initiatives at this time. So the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which I've quoted there, um, and there was also the kind of Berlin Dec Declaration on Open Access, um, and there's definitely been a lot uh, written on the history of the kind of open access movement, if you'd like to delve deeper as well. And some of the other open initiatives coming out at this time uh, was PubMed Central, which is a repository uh, that archives open access content, it was started by the National Institute of Health in the US, and also the first open access publisher, which was Biomed Central. So I just wanted to put in a quick poll here before I move into kind of options for scientific publishing uh, to get a sense of how much of the audience have actually published a scientific article. So Tony, I don't know if you can make that poll live. Yes, perfect. I think I'm going to end the poll there as everyone, as most people have voted. So thank you for doing that. Oh, okay. So that's a, a two third split. So only a third of the audience have published scientific article. Um, which is really interesting. And hopefully this next bit will be interesting to give you a kind of a, a bit more of an insight into that process. So yeah, if you are a scientist today, kind of what are your options for publishing? So I've got a little kind of timeline here of when you'd be publishing and when that would kind of occur in the research timeline. 
So to begin with, uh, you're starting your research, you're designing your study or your experiment and kind of carrying that out. So you wouldn't be publishing at this stage, but what you could be doing is kind of engaging in other open practices. And um, I put a few examples here, such as pre-registration, which is registering your research plan before you start your study, putting together a data management plan, or kind of openly collaborating through something like GitHub. So then you've kind of finished your study experiment, you've got some results that you'd like to put out there. Um, so what are your options to publish? Um, and the answer is many. So let's start off with kind of some of these options here. Um, so the first is kind of pre-journal publication, um, which we refer to as preprints. So what are preprints? The clue is kind of in the name. Uh, this is posting a version of your scientific paper on a preprint server before formally submitting it to a journal. So the Physical Sciences preprint server, which is called Archive, launched in the 90s, but it took a little while for the life sciences to catch up. So they launched kind of BioArchive in 2013. And then since then, more discipline specific preprint servers have been set up, such as ChemArchive and SociArchive. So you may think, why do scientists need preprint servers if they have journals? And the point is, is that journals can be really inefficient. It can often take up to a year to publish a paper as the journal is organizing things like the peer review process and preprints don't have that peer review process. So the papers can be posted in a matter of days. And this means the science is out there earlier for others to start building upon. It can bring more visibility to your work and you're also able to get feedback on your work before potentially submitting it to a journal. So some people claim kind of slightly dubiously that preprints can reduce what's often called scooping. So often when you've submitted your work to a journal and you're waiting for it to be published, then others could be working on something similar and they actually might manage to get their work published before yours, reducing the impact of yours since it's out there already in a journal. So it's kind of already considered done. So people kind of say preprints allow you to kind of put a stamp and say, this is the results we've got, it's all out in the open, kind of we did it first. And the posting of preprints was already on the up, but accelerated even more during the pandemic as people uh, couldn't wait for journals to get the results out. And this did mean that sometimes newspapers and the media were quoting results from preprints. That's definitely something I saw a lot more of during the pandemic, which is a point of contention because peer review isn't a perfect process, but at least you have kind of had some other scientists checking your work to an extent. Preprints don't have that check, meaning that the results might not always be accurate, especially kind of when they're being quoted far and wide. And preprints are also a good example of how scientists help to change journals' behavior. Initially, there was a lot of pushback from journals around preprints, that you couldn't submit your paper to a journal if it was up on a preprint server, as they counted this as prior publication. However, so many scientists started publishing preprints that the journals were kind of forced to change this policy. And now some journals such as eLife are actively encouraging preprints. So I also just wanted to know how many in the audience have posted a preprint. Um, I think potentially not that many, um, if only kind of 30% have published a research article, but this would be, be interesting to know. Ah, same split, which is interesting. So a third of people have posted a research article and a preprint, which I think is, is really interesting to know. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for that, good to know. Um, so moving on, um, so say you've, you're a scientist, you've posted a preprint and you've decided you would now like to submit to a journal. What are your kind of options for this? So this kind of middle section here. So many different types of journal, and you might select on a kind of variety of different factors. So you might select a journal that is in your specific area of research or kind of broader interdisciplinary journal. The journal you choose might have open peer review, where the peer review reports are published openly um, alongside your article or the reviewers are not anonymous. But ultimately the journal you'll be publishing in will be one of these types uh, when it comes to whether your article is freely available or not. Also these types can vary by license, which is something I'm not gonna go into detail about as it's a whole different talk, but just wanted to flag. Um, so let's start with kind of subscription journals, which we touched upon earlier. So the traditional type that was established in the kind of 1950s 
where there's no cost for the author to publish here, but you'll only be able to access the content if your institution subscribes to the journal. You might have seen recently kind of universities negotiating with big publishers for access to a kind of bundle of journals around this, um, which can often generate a lot of controversy. Gold open access, the article is free for anyone to access, but the author will be paying an article processing charge to publish in the journal, and the cost of this can vary widely. A way around this can be diamond open access, which is exactly the same, but that article processing charge could be paid by a society or a funder. So for example, Cielo in uh, South America is a platform supported by South American governments, and therefore it's free for authors to publish there. And a criticism of kind of open access journals is that they're often seen as lower quality, very heavy on the quote marks here. So the subscription journals often have very high rejection rates and try to publish the most kind of groundbreaking science, whilst the open access journals often publish more and publish any science that is technically sound. A kind of good advantage of open access journals though is that studies have shown your work is more likely to be cited if it's published there, as opposed to a subscription journal kind of makes sense as more people can see it. And there's also shown to be a citation advantage if you post a preprint too. And then lastly, the fourth option on the side is hybrid. So these are subscription journals where you can pay, to pay a fee to have your article open so anyone can access it. But these are ultimately subscription journals. So there's a lot of criticism around these in terms of this phrase kind of double dipping. So these journals are making revenue from subscriptions but also making revenue from these open access fees. Um, the journal line kind of around these is that this allows authors to publish openly, but in traditional journals, but you can see there's kind of some controversy around that as well. Um, so another poll here. So I just, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of cost of an article processing charge can vary widely. Um, so I wanted to do a kind of prices right uh, slide. So what do you think you would be able to buy uh, with the average amount uh, that an APC costs. So this is what you'd pay to publish one paper in one journal. What do you think the kind of average cost is for that? Um, so Tony, if you can launch the poll, thank you. So yeah, the, the items go up in price as they go to the right of the slide. I'm so curious to know how many people are buying an hour with James Corden. <laughs> Took me a while to find that price. <laughs> Give it 10 more seconds. Great, everyone's voted. We can end the poll and share the results. Okay, very, a bit split. So we've got 12% on the coffee machine, 41% on the flight to Tokyo. 29% on the souped up mini, and then 18% on James Corden. So if I go here, you can see the actual costs uh, for each item. And the average APC cost is £2,000, uh, which I'd be interested to know how many of you are quite shocked by how much that is. Um, and just to kind of give you an example here is that Journals can switch between these types. So the journal Nature has always been a subscription journal, but recently they've offered a hybrid option. So they announced you can publish your paper openly there, uh, but their fee is £8,000 just for one paper. So you can imagine this kind of stirred some discussion when it was announced. And then the final option uh, just to cover is kind of green open access here. Um, so green open access is self archiving a version of your paper. Some people refer to preprinting as a form of green open access, um, but green is mainly referred to in what happens kind of post journal publishing. So say if you've published in an open access journal, you might put a copy of your paper in your institution's repository or a subject specific repository to make it more discoverable. And then if you've published in a subscription journal, then you might want to do this to actually have a copy of your work openly available. And this is a great option because it's free. However, you do need to be careful as often subscription journals won't let you post a copy of your work anywhere for kind of six to 12 months after they've published. Um, many authors are kind of caught unaware of this. So a great site to check is the Sherpa Romeo, which will kind of tell you policies around these kind of embargoes. 
So you've heard the options of kind of where a scientist can publish. So what does the landscape of journals kind of currently look like? So mainly due to that kind of commercialization process in the 1950s, um, there is what a lot of people refer to as a kind of publishing monopoly. You're likely to be publishing a journal owned by just one of five companies, and they've published half of all the academic papers from 1973 onwards. And then a 2012 estimate uh, says there's around 40,000 scientific journals, which is obviously a huge number, and the majority of these are now online based. Uh, but despite that, there hasn't been a lot of innovations in terms of how journal articles are presented over that kind of 350 year period that they've been around. The majority still have a very kind of traditional format and are just kind of presented as a PDF. So only recently have we had journals trying to make articles a bit more interactive. And in the present moment, we still kind of have this tug between subscription and open access. Although it's slowly increasing, only around the third of the scientific literature is open access. And there are kind of strong arguments to push for this to be a default. So yeah, in conclusion, kind of slow change in the system here. And it does basically kind of all come down to money. So the push for open particularly comes from kind of moral obligation around knowledge sharing. And most of the time science is taxpayer funded. So why shouldn't the public kind of have access to the results? But it's hard to push for open when the public is basically paying thrice. So they're paying first to fund the research, secondly for an article processing charge to make the work open, and thirdly for subscriptions to journals uh, to access the knowledge there as well. Um, and this knowledge is often from researchers who can't afford to publish openly. And journal publishers are making a huge profit. So it's often around kind of 40%, which to give you context is higher than Google or Amazon. And they're obviously very keen to keep this status quo, which is why when they do offer open options, they're incredibly expensive, as in the example of that Nature APC. And what does this kind of mean for global scientific knowledge sharing? It means that if you're based in certain parts of the globe, you're going to struggle to access knowledge as your institution might not have a subscription. I mean, if you want to publish openly and benefit from that, then you're unlikely to be able to afford the APC. And the irony of all of this is that uh, scientists are providing free labor to keep these journals going, which is why I've kind of included this meme from the theme uh, from the film Don't Look Up because there's a debate around how much value journals actually add to a scientific paper when the authors are writing it in the first place. The peer review to check the article is done properly is done by their peers for free. And then all you're kind of ending up with is, a, is just a PDF. Um, so yeah, you might be wondering, this seems like a very complicated, time consuming, expensive process just to publish scientific results. Why are scientists participating in the system? And it comes back to this kind of evaluation phase here. So I'd highly recommend this video. You can find it on Twitter, but it is a kind of spoof on why scientists bother and how ridiculous the system is. Um, so apart from the core idea that sharing your results is good for science, publishing is kind of heavily tied to a scientist's career, uh, which in this video is referred to as the prestige. Um, and this is also referred to in this phrase kind of publish or perish. So whilst the system is slowly changing, and I'll touch on this more later, traditionally promotions, progressing in your career, and being awarded funding have all rested on how much you publish and whether you're publishing in high impact journals. Um, and how do we judge what is an impactful journal? So traditionally it's been done on this very ridiculously simple calculation, which I've included here, which is the number of citations on the paper divided by uh, the number of articles published by the journal. And you can see how you can easily game that. So the more a journal rejects, the higher the impact factor of the journal gets. And it's, you can see how that's kind of pretty inappropriate for judging an individual scientist's impact. But this has really persisted. So you'll still find scientists being asked if they've published in high impact journals. And if scientists are tied to this broken system to have a successful career, what does this mean for how we do science? If you're chasing to publish in a high impact journal, you're going to need some kind of flashy results, which encourages bad practice. You might kind of cut some corners, or you might even kind of deliberately exclude some data to get some more kind of impressive looking results. 
And what does this mean for science? It means a lot of the science out there is actually not really reproducible, particularly in the high impact journals. So we've seen a reproducibility crisis in fields such as psychology and medicine, where many of the results are difficult to reproduce. And this also means there's a lot of inefficiency in the system. So say you do an experiment, you get a negative result, uh, and that's difficult to publish in a journal, you can't be bothered. So you kind of just leave it in your desk drawer. But this means that someone else might attempt the same experiment, not knowing that you already attempted it and also get a negative result, but it's a waste of time and resources. And they could have not done that experiment if they knew those kind of results were already out there. And also this reliance on evaluating scientists on their publication record also means it's difficult for certain types of scientists or research support staff to get credit for their work. Um, outputs uh, such as kind of software and data sets from people like data stewards and research software engineers. Um, many journals won't kind of publish this type of output, so it's difficult for them to get credit. So we can probably kind of agree that the system is broken, uh, but who's trying to change it and how are they trying to change it? So I first wanted to kind of start off with the publishers themselves. Um, shout out to my old employer, F1000 Research, along with journals such as Giga Science and the Journal of Open Source Software, who are allowing different formats of papers to be published. So not just the traditional research articles, but things like data notes and software tool articles, which means researchers can get credit for a range of different research outputs. And eLife as well are kind of doing a lot of cool stuff, particularly encouraging preprints. And they've also been experimenting with kind of reproducible articles and interactive articles and things like that. And there are also some solutions in setting up new ways of publishing and publishing platforms. You can find quite a few of these, um, but a few examples I've pulled here. So Octopus, where you can publish hypotheses, analyses, methods, and results all separately, and you can publish there for free. Research Equals, um, which set up recently, is step-by-step -step publishing, so they're calling it micro-publishing, and also the Peer Community Journal, which is free and academic organised. And I also wanted to mention here um, SciHub, which is always embroiled in a lot of controversy, but basically it's a pirate site which illegally bypasses publishers' paywalls and allows you to download subscription articles. So the founder, Alexander Elbakian, is often seen as kind of a Robin Hood of publishing, but as you can imagine, she is often facing a lot of lawsuits for kind of copyright infringement. And I do also just want to highlight here that there are kind of legal ways of trying to look for open versions of the paper too. So one paywall searches the net for an open uh, version of a paper. The open access button does the same. And also um, it lets you kind of uh, send a request to the authors uh, for an open version of the paper or just a copy of the paper, which I wanted to flag you can always do as well. You can always, if you come across a kind of subscription journal, you can just email the authors and ask for a copy of the paper and that's completely fine and free to do. So those are some examples of how kind of the publishing system can be changed by the publishers, but how could the funders kind of play a role in changing the system? And many argue that kind of funders could be the kind of key influence here. They have a strong influence over researchers who obviously always want funding and they have an influence over the kind of ecosystem in general. So what are some of the actions that funders have been taking in the publishing landscape? So some of you may have heard of Plan S, which launched uh, around four years ago now, which is a group of 27 international funders, uh, mainly European, such as the Wellcome Trust, UKRI, the Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization. And they got together really to accelerate open access. They were fed up of publishers kind of dragging their feet. So they've leveraged their power as a group of funders and said that any research they fund needs to be published openly by the researchers. So journals like Nature, before it conveniently came up with an open option, would not be eligible for researchers with this funding to publish in. The compromise to this is that journals uh, can be considered transformative. So this is if they're transitioning from those different types I showed earlier to a more open model. Um, so the research funders might let you publish in a kind of transformative journal, but that can get kind of slightly murky. 
UKRI is the main UK government science funder and also a member of Plan S, and they've developed a new open access policy, which is about to come into force in April, and actually goes a bit further than Plan S in terms of defining what is a transformative journal. So this all kind of sounds good in terms of kind of progressing openness, but there's actually been a lot of pushback, um, particularly around this kind of term of academic freedom. So some academics are not happy that they can't publish in these high impact subscription journals and feel if they're not allowed to, this will actually kind of harm their careers. Um, but I would argue how much kind of academic freedom they had in the system in the first place. So I think you can kind of debate this either way. And the final innovation we've seen from funders uh, is funders actually becoming publishers themselves. Again, some work from my time at F1000 Research, where we supported funders building their own journals using our open model. Funders basically saw it as a service they were providing to their researchers, so an outlet for all the different types of research they fund, supporting an open model. And it was actually cheaper for them to become publishers themselves than pay the publishers the current article processing charges. Um, so this kicked off, the first one was with the Wellcome Trust, and now several different funders have set up journals, such as the African Academy of Sciences, and most recently the European Commission too. And then if we've covered kind of publishers and funders, where can institutions and universities play a role? And I think this closely overlaps with the funders. The pushbacks from the journals themselves is that research culture is nothing to do with us, we're just the endpoint. So who should be responsible for shifting the incentives, i.e. to improve how researchers carry out their science and the kind of researcher behaviour? And I think that is a kind of combination of funders and institutions. If researchers are evaluated by their institutions and funders and more than just their publication record, then this will stop them chasing those kind of flashy results. And I think one example is that open science um, particularly can give us uh, an opportunity to evaluate researchers in a more holistic way. Institutions can also lead the way by having a clear open access policy and supporting their researchers to publish in an open manner. So I wanted to flag here that Turing has an open access policy and also an open access block grant. I think Ariel was here and she administers that. And um, so you can apply for funds to publish your paper paper openly through that. And universities uh, kind of also jointly have a lot of negotiation, negotiating power. So you, they can kind of UK universities have been negotiating as a group for better deals from publishers, but they recently just accepted a deal from the publisher Elsevier, which really has disappointed a lot of people as they felt the universities should not accept this deal and kind of work instead for kind of sustainable open options rather than being kind of locked into commercial publishing infrastructure. So I think ultimately everyone has a role to play, but I think people often forget the power does live with the researchers themselves. Journals have such a hold and it is really difficult to go against the grain, but researchers do so much for journals that if they stop submitting to them and stop reviewing for them, then journals really would just disappear overnight. And I think mean, kind of two examples, which I think are really interesting. The first I already mentioned was preprints and how journals were initially very kind of resistant to accept papers that have been published as preprints. But the amount of researchers posting them meant they had to change their policies pretty quick. So I, I think it's an interesting discussion to think about what else we could do as researchers to lobby journal policies to change, potentially around things like open data. And then the hidden ref, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, for those of you that do know, I've probably struck terror into your soul, but the research excellent framework is a system to assess the quality of research in UK higher education institutions. Um, the ref accepts a kind of range of submission types to demonstrate this impact, but the majority submitted to show off impact are, you guessed it, publications. So this uh, Hidden Ref initiative uh, actually made the kind of effort to celebrate a range of outputs and a range of people involved in research rather than just kind of publications. So I really encourage you to kind of check that out. So I hope that was a, a helpful overview of publishing. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, before I do, I just wanted to quickly plug the Turing Way, which uh, I wouldn't be doing my duty as a member of Tools, Practices and Systems if I didn't do this. Um, so we have a open access chapter in Maturing Way, and we're about to have a peer review chapter two. 
Um, but we're really keen to kind of expand this and we always welcome kind of contributions or ideas for what would be useful. So maybe something around kind of tips on how to publish. So do let me know if you're interested in this um, and if you'd like to collaborate as well. Thank you very much.